Yo, this is Jarmancer here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the Asus MG279Q 144Hz FreeSync Monitor. If you don't know what any of those terms mean, don't worry, we'll go over them in a bit. First, we're going to go over my PC specs for those of you interested in what I was using to test the monitor. My system includes a Gigabyte GAX79 UD3 motherboard, an Intel i7-4960X, a Gigabyte WinForce GTX 960, 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance RAM, and a 250 gig SSD, a 1 terabyte mechanical drive, and an off-brand Korean 2560 by 1440 60Hz monitor. I also have a second monitor that sits to the side of my main monitor, but I don't use that for gaming, so we won't worry about that. I mentioned that I have a GTX 960, which is an NVIDIA graphics card. Unfortunately, NVIDIA graphics cards don't work with FreeSync, so I replaced my graphics card with a Sapphire DualX R9-285 for the duration of my time with this monitor. Other than replacing my main monitor and graphics card, all the other computer specs stayed the same. Before diving into the display itself, let's take a look at the monitor as a whole. As you'll see, the monitor features a sleek black stealth fighter look with a few red accents. The display is roughly 23 and a half inches wide and 13 inches tall, with half inch bezels which together make the monitor 24 and a half inches wide and 14 inches tall. The monitor is mounted on a stand that allows it to be turned sideways as well as adjusted up and down by a total of roughly 6 inches. The stand can also swivel the monitor a total of 120 degrees as well as 20 degrees upwards and 5 degrees downwards. With the stand attached to the monitor, it weighs in at about 16 pounds. The monitor supports HDMI as well as standard and mini DisplayPort. It also features a USB 3 hub on the back, though it's quite a pain to reach. A small cable management device comes along with all these cables so you can tuck them away behind the monitor stand. There are also two stereo speakers built in the back of the monitor that are standard for monitor speakers, meaning you pretty much never want to use them unless you're mounting the monitor on a wall as a TV. The final component of the monitor outside the display is the control scheme. Placed on the front bottom of the right bezels are six icons that look like standard button icons. The actual buttons, however, are on the back of the monitor directly behind the icons with each icon corresponding to the button behind it. Despite what you might think, these buttons are actually easier than front-facing buttons. Your hand naturally grips around the side of the display like a big tablet with your fingers resting on the buttons. Another twist is that, instead of an up and down button, one of the buttons is basically a mini joystick that can be moved in four directions as well as clicked. To me, this control scheme is very easy to use, and I give major props to Asus for making it so. So, the controls might be easy to use, but what can you do with them? The controls are very well thought out, but they won't get much use. Asus packaged a bunch of, quote, gaming features into the monitor that can be accessed using the monitor controls. But, in my opinion, they aren't very useful. The gaming features include game visuals, which are basically presets for contrast, brightness, color, as well as a few other filters. These presets are labeled for specific games such as FPS visuals and racing visuals, but most of them don't change much and aren't very useful or nice looking in my opinion. The cinema mode, however, really impressed me when I first turned it on. Everything seemed so much sharper, yet as I began to look around I found that a lot of things seemed pixely, especially text. It turns out that among other things, cinema mode adds a sharpening filter to things which makes edges a lot more apparent. Despite the ugly edges, I decided to press on and use cinema mode for a little while as I still liked how clear everything looked. But after about 10 minutes, my eyes began to hurt and I had to switch it off. Basically, the moral of the story is that game visuals only look nice in very specific situations and terrible otherwise. The other thing about messing with how your display looks is, game developers and software engineers design things to look a specific way in order to give it a certain vibe and feel. Messing with this isn't really a good idea in my opinion. Monitors look a certain way for a reason. They found the best way for everything to look good rather than getting a few small advantages for a lot of downsides. So I personally stick with just standard sRGB mode. The gaming features of this monitor also include crosshair overlays, but are too ugly, pixely, and bulky, especially when aiming down sights. If you want a crosshair overlaid on your screen, there are tons of programs that do this with better looking crosshairs that don't get in your way. Among other features with similar fates, I actually find the blue light filter nice when turned on an hour before going to bed. It's very easy to turn on, and there are five varying levels of filter.blue. Once again, you can get software that does the same thing, but in this instance, the built-in versions aren't worse than software versions. So let's dive into the actual display itself now. The display is 27 inches from corner to quarter and 2560 by 1440 with a pixel density of 109 pixels per inch. It's also an IPS display which translates to almost no color shift and a beautiful looking display. This is kind of a big deal when it comes to FreeSync displays as most FreeSync displays are currently TN panels. 
It's also 144 Hz, which is a big deal for IPS displays. If you aren't familiar with FreeSync technology or 144 Hz, I'll give you a quick rundown. 144 Hz means that the display can be refreshed 144 times a second which translates to a max of 144 frames per second on this display. Most displays are only 60 Hz, which converts to a max of 60 frames per second. You might say, I get more than 60 frames per second on my 60 Hz display. This is actually true due to a disconnect between how quickly a display can refresh itself and how quickly your computer is spitting out frames to be displayed. If you have more than 60 frames per second on a 60 Hz display, you'll get frame tearing because those extra frames have to go somewhere, so the display will interrupt a frame that's being drawn on the screen and draw a new one partway through, which results in a big tear in the animation. This looks pretty ugly, so people often turn on what's called vSync. vSync caps FPS at the refresh rate of the display, so if you're getting more frames than the refresh rate, tearing won't occur. So what does this mean for 144Hz? This means that 144Hz is able to reach higher frames per second without tearing, so you can game over 60 FPS, which potentially makes the game look much smoother. I say potentially because even if you have an average of 144 frames per second, this doesn't mean you don't have stuttering. Stuttering occurs when it's time for a frame to be displayed on the screen, but the frame isn't ready yet. So the monitor will wait to the next interval to show the next frame. Now, keep in mind, this is all happening in the span of milliseconds. So even if the frame is late by half a millisecond, the display will wait till the next interval. This is where FreeSync comes in, also known as Variable Refresh, which also comes in the form of NVIDIA's G-Sync. Variable refresh basically tries to spit out frames as fast as possible, while also giving a bit of leeway for slightly late frames by varying the intervals at which frames must be displayed. So if a frame is slightly late, the display will wait a few milliseconds in order to update the display with that new frame instead of waiting till the next interval to display the new frame. This is a very basic description of FreeSync, so if you want a more detailed explanation, there will be a link in the description below to an article on variable refresh technology. So this monitor has generally smooth animation with 144Hz, as well as FreeSync to patch up the hiccups. Great! Well, not exactly. There are various FreeSync control chips, and unfortunately, FreeSync on this monitor only works from 35 to 90 hertz. So you can't have 144Hz at the same time as FreeSync. Now you do have 90 hertz with FreeSync, which is still faster than standard 60 hertz, but you can't have the best of both worlds. In order to test the monitor's capabilities with both 144Hz and FreeSync, I played a variety of games including Borderlands 2, Dirty Bomb, Toxic, Warframe, Project Cars, and Chivalry Medieval Warfare. I switched between FreeSync and 144Hz, but kept all other settings the same while gaming in order to remove any unnecessary variables. Immediately after switching from my old monitor to the new one, I was blown away by how much smoother 144Hz and FreeSync were than my normal setup. Both are great options that yield great results, but I didn't want to stop there. After spending a few weeks with this monitor, I came to a couple of conclusions. First of all, the higher up in monitor refresh rate you go, the harder it is to tell the difference. Both 90Hz and 144Hz are drastically better than 60Hz, but the difference between 144Hz and 90Hz is visibly not as large, especially once you add FreeSync onto 90Hz. Another thing about 144Hz is, a lot of games aren't going to be reaching FPS that can take advantage of 144Hz. Also, a lot of games that reach 144FPS are top-down games like League of Legends, in which the difference in frame rate isn't as noticeable as first-person games. So if you primarily play MOBAs, this monitor isn't going to be as much of a jump up as it will be for those who play first-person shooters, where twitch reflex and fast-paced gameplay rely on smooth animations and high responsiveness. This is why the games I tested were mostly first-person games. The smoother animations were quite noticeable, and it almost feels like cheating when you can quickly swipe your mouse left or right, and you can get a good view of everything around you instead of it all being a blur. Gaming just feels like a much more fluid experience with either 144Hz or FreeSync, but just playing 144Hz falls behind in some cases. Generally, if you're getting an average of 120 frames or above, you aren't going to be having any stuttering, so FreeSync isn't really necessary at these high frame rates. But once you start to sync down in FPS, you'll get occasional stutters, and this is where FreeSync really starts to shine. If you're running a game at 90 FPS or below, you should always have FreeSync on, as it is always the better option. Even so, playing 144 Hz is a viable option if you aren't getting any stuttering and you want to turn up your FPS cap, and it's still better than standard 60 Hz. Asus did a good job of implementing both of these technologies into their monitor, even if it's a bummer you can't run FreeSync at 144 Hz. The monitor isn't plagued by ghosting like other FreeSync monitors out there, plus it's an IPS panel which is a huge plus in some people's books. There are some good TN FreeSync panels out there, 
but for being at the same price as some of those, the IPS panel is a nice addition. Just keep in mind, NVIDIA graphics cards won't work with FreeSync, but don't worry. If you have NVIDIA graphics, there are G-Sync monitors out there as well. At the time of making this video, this monitor is going to set you back by $600. For being one of the first IPS FreeSync monitors, this is definitely worth a buy. If you enjoyed this video, you can subscribe to the channel or also go to techreport.com for more computer hardware news and reviews. Thanks all for watching. Later.